Well, hello, and welcome to How to Diorama with Scale Modelcraft. I am Bill, and um, today we're going to talk about a weird week because I did a lot of editing, and I didn't do as much um, like painting, which which is what I really wanted to be doing. Well, I mean, I liked obviously I liked doing the editing too because I got a video out, which was really fun. But um, I really wanted to get more progress on my on my painting, so. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about um, how to make barbed wire, scale barbed wire. And that's what this is. So this is this honking lens here. I've got it trained right on here. And I'm going to show you real quick. I'm going to swap over uh, so you can see it. Um, and this is going to allow you to see what I'm doing when I'm making this scale barbed wire. So I hope that's not going to be a distraction. I've also got to be super careful because, you know, this little piece of wire, it's 30, 32 gauge copper wire, basically, or I think it's brass wire. Um, and and, and I, I just like put my hand through it and like break it all the time. So anyway, it's going to be kind of fun. Um, so thank you very much for coming up. I want to say hi to folks. Uh, Paul is here. Paul Christopher's here. Thanks very much for coming on, Paul. That's really super nice. And then Scott was cool. He's like, hey, man. You know, uh, be sure to like and subscribe. I need to say that more. And 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 I'm totally, I don't know. I pfft, I just don't. And so I need to. And, and I'm sorry, I've got the camera all wonky today. So I'm like looking at the screen here, but the camera's up here. So I don't, I'll try to pay a little bit more attention to that. Um, so thank you very much. That's really cool, Scott. Uh, and then Eric's here. Hello, Eric. Thanks very much for coming on. I really appreciate you coming out. Um so I, I've got my slides like I, I typically do. So I want to show you those. And then I, I've also got something that's kind of cool. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to do it. But I think like right at the end of the live stream today, I'm going to show you a sneak peek of the video that's already uploaded for Tuesday of next week. And what it is, is it's the first of my um, of my all dioramas videos. So I'll show you in just a second. So let's go to those slides real quick and I'll, and I'll show you what the heck I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, that's not what I want. I want that. There we go. So these are the slides I put together for today. And um, uh, I, like I've, I've been doing here lately, I just want to kind of explain the, um, we got the, uh, uh, or what, what this is all about. This is all about this World War I trench diorama that I'm doing. And I started it in July. Um, I still don't have a name. I have three grid suggestions, but I don't have a name for it yet. Um, and then, oops, I got a, uh, uh, ba -da -ba -da. Scott is saying hi. Uh, we got your back, Bill. Thanks very much, Scott. That's awesome. You guys are just really, really cool. Um, so uh, that's what this whole project is. And then this is the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector. This is one of the subjects. It's not the only subject. Now, you know, I think this is important because I really like the fact that part of this is about the, the Anzacs and, you know, those folks that did the mining. I, you know, I saw that Beneath Hill 60 movie. And um, if you haven't seen it, it's great. I, I know some of you have. Eric, you know, he, he got the chance to see it. And I really like it. Um, but they did a tremendous job during World War I. And, you know, because it was underground, not just because it was underground, but it just, you don't, you don't hear about that stuff as much. And so it's a, a really amazing story. And, and, and I wanted to bring some of that to light. So it's also Anzacs and the Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector. So, okay, I just want to get that out of the way. Uh, back to that. So here is the video that I put out. So earlier this week, and, and this was really fun because... It kind of came out by accident. I I want to do the, sh the fall shop tour because I had just kind of cleaned up the shop and had family over. And I'm like, well, you know, when it's nice and all spotless and clean and stuff like that, you know, I'll just I'll, I'll do a little video. Well, that little video turned into an hour and like four minutes. Um, of just me rambling. And, and and I didn't even get to show you everything in the shop. I didn't really get to go over and look at the metal area. And I want to show you that because that that where I do metal work, copper work, and, and things like that, um, brass work, um, I think that's pretty integral. I, I do, I don't do it on every single diorama that I do, 
but I do enough brass and, and, and stuff work like that in scratch building that I think it's a, a pretty important part of the shop. Just like everything I do, you know, some of the stuff is smaller. I have like some smaller tools and, and, and like a, a, a tiny lathe and stuff like that. So that's the kind of stuff I want to show you over there. So I will add that to following videos because I'm going to do a follow-up. Now, there's another follow-up that came out of this. And that was because I had my dioramas on a table, right? So my dioramas are out on a table. And so I figure, oh, I'll show you some dioramas. Well, then it turned into this thing where I'm going to show you all my dioramas now. So I, I don't know. So let me show you this. So this is what I came up with. Oh, I'm getting dry in the throat already. Excuse me. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this is going to be like the leader for showing you all my dioramas. I'm going to do videos on every single one. And, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, when I get a dry throat like that, it just makes me cough. <laughs> this is my very first diorama where I use the ground effects that I learned from uh, Andy Klein from Andy's Hobby Headquarters. I'll try to zoom in here a little bit better. But uh, I, this is, you know, um, it's it's a very old to me kit, comes with five figures, and that's just brilliant. You know, if you're just getting into it, you got the whole package right there, and then you can come up with your own terrain. So it's just a wonderful kit for that. There's not a heck of a lot of detail on the, um, on the vehicle, uh, and I have no excuse for that paint job. I have no idea what I was thinking. Um, it's not really even a paint job. It was just me dabbing paint on it. These figures didn't come out too bad. I was, you know, I, I kind of dog myself on my figures because I really have a, issues with my own figures. And then I'll see something I did. It's like, well, that's actually not too bad. I do want to kind of tell a little story. I want to make something a little bit conceivable. Now, when they give you these figures, they're molded in such a way that they almost tell their own story. You know, one guy's running out, one guy's on the gun. You know, this guy's got binos, the guy on the left, the lieutenant, I'm thinking, you know, the officer that's with him. He's like calling him up to set up a position. You know, they go through this little tiny wadi and and on the other side, they set up a machine gun, a cruiser weapon. And, and I think that's neat because the kit itself kind of gets you into that mode, right? It gets you thinking that you can make a little story out of the kit and, and the figures. I mean, I think that's just brilliant because it helped me. It totally told me that I could do that. So what is this? This is uh, foam, just the regular pink foam that I always use. Uh, I carved it with my Fordham. Love it. My Fordham is the best. I used real rock. I used real pebbles and stuff like that. I used the scenic glue from Woodland Scenic, glued everything down. Then I did dusts and, and, and then I overshot it. And I, I did actually quite a bit of work because I didn't know what it was doing. I was trying to get, you know, a look. And, and one of the things, and I'm gonna zoom in again. One of the things that I really liked about doing this was there can be sandy areas in the wadi and stuff like that. But there can also be rock or just hardened sandstone under the loose sand. And that's kind of what I'm doing with those cliffs because those little cliffs there are a little bit darker. And that just told me, man, I can really actually get a believable surface. And that's the thing that had uh, discouraged me all in the past when I tried to do plaster. Plaster always seemed to be something that I never got a handle on. Now, I did do plaster. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you that one next.
I'm so sorry, folks. Gosh, darn it. Um, you know, I do these things. What I was trying to say is that was half the video that I, I'm now uh, uh, editing. That one's done. And that's going to release on Tuesday. And I was trying to tell you that before. Um, I was trying to tell you that before the video started, but I got, I got a coughing fit. So the point is, this is a little bit new video format. And this new video format is kind of a hybrid between shooting it, just looking at what I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you about, and then using the build footage in it. And I hope you like it because what was so difficult about putting up or posting um, multiple videos, well, you know, a long form video once a week was all that production time. It, it, it takes an, immen an immense amount of time to kind of do the production. And if you do uh, with the voice or, or with the sound off, I'm not sure if I covered this, um, with, with doing audio, like doing a voiceover for your video, that can, for me at least, can add another day. <clears throat> so this is meant to be a little bit easier to get out a longer form video. I show you a lot more data than in just like the little shorts that I do. And I can consistently get a video out once a week. So I'm going to do a long form video on Tuesdays at 10. I'm still doing my shorts every day about, you know, my updates or the build that I'm doing. But I'm also going to be adding a longer form video each week um, in this kind of new format. Uh, and, and, and I hope you like it. And, and I'd love to have your feedback. So sorry about the difficulties, folks. I, you know, I was trying to set that up and tell you, look, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of this video that's coming out on Tuesday. And then I get a coughing fit and I couldn't. And then I turn off the sound and oh, my goodness. So thank you very much for your patience. I really appreciate that. So anyway, that is coming out on Tuesday. Um, I think you'll like it. It's on uh, two of my um, dioramas. The very first one I did, which was Half Track 2 to Brook, the one that we just saw. The second one it's going to be, and then they're not in order, but I did want to do the very first one I did in the first video. Um, but Narvik, Battle of Narvik is going to be the second one in that video. And, and it's really fun because... I think some folks maybe haven't seen these. I've, I've done them a long time ago. They're like a year ago that I, I did them. And um, they're really fun dioramas. Um, but I don't talk about them much, you know, so this is kind of a neat way to show all my dioramas. So every week I'll have a new video. Um, it'll include all build information and all that kind of stuff. Uh, as much that I have, you know, like people ask me how many hours, some of that, I don't know. But I'll have that each week now. So, um, yeah, I hope you like it. And, and please tell me if you like the format. It is something that I'm trying. It's a little bit different. Like I said, it's a hybrid between my short videos and like the really expansive kind of highly produced videos I, I, I do. Um, those are fun and I enjoy them, but they just take a heck of a lot of time. So let's take a look back. Um, at, at what we got going on in these here slides and show you that some of the painting stuff because I there's some interesting stuff that I did this week in painting. Thanks very much, Eric. I, I really appreciate that. I love Narvik. Narvik, that Battle of Narvik diorama I did, I really, really enjoyed. It is, I, I did it for my nephew, Will. Um, I've done a couple for him uh, just because we would build together, you know? And so I, I really like that one. And it's got a neat story. It's unfortunately, it's in the shop right now here in the shop because it needs to be worked on um, the electronics. I, I messed those up. And so I got to do a, a new Arduino in it. Um, and I'll film that as you imagine I would so that I can show you how I repair it. So uh, let's go back to the slides and I'm going to show you some more stuff about my painting this week. So this is one of the characters that I did. And this is one of the, the, the drivers, and I've converted him so that he looks like he's playing cards. And, uh, you know, he does have his eyelids down, so I haven't just totally boned that up. But um, he's not done. Uh, but this is the best of the figures that I did this week. I haven't touched his uniform yet. It's just the face and the, the, the hands and, and stuff like that. Um, here's the other guy that I worked heavily on, and, and this is one of the guys that I modified previously. And um, later on, I also want to show you, um, I've got 
like the original. So this is the original box for one of the figures. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down how I did like the different configuration of the figure. Configuration of the figure? Yeah. So how I took like this leg, that torso, this arm, and configured a couple of different figures from these guys. Because they look similar. You know, they've got the same parts, obviously. But by swapping them around, I got figures that I really liked. And I thought, you know, showed what I really wanted to show. So that's the other thing we're going to do a little bit uh, later on in the in the slides. Um, so uh, what I had done was I block painted or, or like blocked these guys in, meaning that I just put on their basic coat of paint. Uh, and that's the same with these guys. It's just the basic coat of paint. And then I'll go back in and start doing the detailing. That's just how I do it. Now, this guy, <clears throat> we're going to come back to this guy because this is one of the guys that uh, I modified. We just saw him a couple minutes ago and I needed to give him a shirt. So I'm trying to give him like one of those three button, like undershirt kind of things. Um, this has to be completely repainted, but that's what I finally decided on because I previously had done some other stuff. It just did not work. Um, I was taking, and you're going to see this because I've got this guy out and we're going to take a look at him real tight and real close up. I painted these guys and I kind of did like a dry brushing for the mud. I, it was just tragic. So you're going to see it and it's terrible. And, uh, and then I'll tell you where I'm going with it. Uh, this is another guy that I configured. He's not too far off from his original, uh, pose, but the arms are not even from the same kit. So that's one of the things that I like. It's, it's, um, you know, just moving them around. Uh, this is just one of the uh, uh, ICM kits. I like these kits. These are uh, Anzacs. These are um, a Gallipoli set from ICM. And I got to tell you, I really, really like how they've molded it. They've got great facial expressions, really good details. You know, when you go to start picking out those details on their uniforms and their clothing, it's all really there nice and crisp. It's not like an old beat up mold that's, you know, like you, you see a lot. Uh, so these are nice figures from ICM. Uh, and then just a picture back to that guy. I don't know why. This is the tragic story of our kicker. Uh, so this is the guy that um, is supposed to be at the front. Now, I, okay, I do a little kabuki here. Right. And, and, and meaning, and, and I use that term and I don't mean it in any way disrespectful. I mean it in the, in, in the, the way that everything is overemphasized, like his elbows and his knees being so bloody and stuff like that. Uh, this is a one thirty fifth figure. So I'm going to have that stuff on there a little bit overdone, but everything else is just tragic on this thing. I mean, let's go back and look at it. It's just horrible. So yeah, I, I, I had a pretty good base and then when I went to dirty him up, it just looked terrible. So um, this guy, I got to go back. I got to completely repaint him and then start over. Now, I, I told you I was going to go back to another guy. I'm going to go back to him now. Um, this guy. This is the, the kind of look that I'm going to go for. Um, the other guys that have the full shirts and stuff like that, I'm going to pair them back. And this is what I'm going to have. I think that undershirt kind of a thing is really what I'm looking for. I want these guys to be down there. They're digging. It's hot. It's a, it's a horrible environment. And so they're in there and, and working really hard. And so they're like down to shorts and undershirts. So I'm going to have these kind of undershirts on and then paint them back to that. I'm going to use smudges. And I'm going to use a little bit of dirt on them. I'm not going to dirty them up like I tried to do before. It just, it, it, it was terrible. What I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the clothing like it's dirty. And then use real dirt, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the sanded grout that I use, to physically put some dirt on them. And that was an, a suggestion from Scott online, a different Scott that, that Scott McLeod is on today. But that uh, is, is what I think I'm going to go with. And I think that will do it. That's going to give me a physical presence of mud and it'll look a lot better. This painting it on it is just, it's garbage. So I just want to show you my fail too. I think it's important that, uh, you know, uh, at least that I'm, I'm, I'm showing you that I, I just completely boned it up. 
So now I want to show you this, this little configuration setup. So now, as bad as this picture is, I want you to physically look at the arms and the legs because that's really what we're talking about here in this. These are the arms that I used for this figure. See those arms? They didn't come with the torso or the, the legs because if you look at the torso, see he's bent and he's kind of bent over. This guy's standing erect. Now, his leg, we're going to look at this other picture. I've got two legs here. I got one kick in the shovel. I got one bent. Well, to get the right one, I used that guy's right leg, this guy sitting. It's his right leg in that picture right there. But his left leg? is the guy standing, the B3 up there. That's the long leg. So that's the one that's kicking. So I just wanted to show you that because it's really, really simple to configure your your um, your figures. Uh, and, and again, we're not looking at my horrible paint job. What we're looking at is the uh, the way that it's configured, the way that you know, you've taken that figure and put them together. Uh, the next one's very similar. See this guy? Um, he's this guy. So the lower torso, his legs are doing that side sitting thing. But the arms, again, just like the other guy that I talked about before, the arms aren't even for this kit. They're not even from this kit anywhere. So I use this leg, these, this torso. I used a different head. As a matter of fact, um, I'm not sure which head, but it's not the same head and different arms from actually a different kit. Uh, and that's going to give me that figure that's going to be sitting in the listening station. So uh, I, I think that came out pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty darn happy with those because they're going to give me the physical look of what I want. I didn't have to like completely make up like the arms and the legs and stuff like that. I want to do that down the road, but I didn't have to this time. Okay, so uh, we're going to go back and take a look at... Uh, this, I did not get a chance to get any pictures out of what the uh, tunnels look like after I did the aging in there. You know, I showed that I did it, but I wasn't able to get in there and show you. And I really wanted to because I think that was, you know, I think they came out great. Um, this dirt up on the wall, it, you know, it's piled against the sides. There's, there's a little bit darker around that because, you know, all the stuff they're moving in and out. Um, I'm really happy with how the dirt and the rubble and the stuff went inside the trenches. So I just thought I'd show you a couple of pictures of that. Now we're talking barbed wire. Okay, so I'm going to do a, a, a demo of this. And barbed wire is something that you can buy. You know, uh, I think Edward has uh, barbed wire and, and it's something flat. And, and I've seen it. Ah, it's not bad. To me, it looks more like modern concertina or razor wire, uh, like I had when I was in the military. Um, and, and I've seen some other stuff that's great, and, I, and I've seen some other techniques about how to make it. My technique, I like the best. I don't know why. It, I think it looks to me the best. It looks more authentic to me. But I have to say, it's not easy. Um, it's a pretty difficult method to do it. It's, it, it might be the hardest way there is to do it, but it makes very authentic looking barbed wire. So let's take a look at that barbed wire again. Uh, that is 135th scale barbed wire. The pickets I've already made, I, I showed you how to do that. So what I'm going to do you now is how to make this and the little jig that I have. So first things first, this is kind of my setup that I have for barbed wire. Um, I use a very specialized, really tight uh, from Crescent, uh, these, these little pliers, the orange handled pliers. Uh, we're going to come back to that. I use 32 gauge wire. Uh, this is black in color. It still needs to be painted, but it's kind of nice to start with that. It's, um, it's copper. Oh, I'm sorry, this is brass wire. Um, it's very thin and it stretches and you can break it very easily. I also use medium gap filling glue. And what you see down there with the, the little rubber bands is when I use this glue, um, I like to put it on a piece of glass. I put down a small rubber band and then I put my glue in it. It gives me a puddle so I can dip uh, my glue looper in it and grab just a small amount of glue. That little, that little um, rubber band 
you know, it's a dental uh, rubber band for like braces you buy it at the, at the um, uh, drugstore. Um, that holds that glue in there and uh, gives me a nice puddle. Uh, and then I can refill it even. So when it's done, it's because it's on glass. I just scrape it off and, and we're done. So it, it works really, really nice. Um, and then Eric, yes, that's quite the wire act. Waka, waka, waka. <laughs> that's pretty good, Eric. Thank you. Those dad jokes are really sinking in, aren't they? Um, okay. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back to the picture because I got more pictures of this. Um, so here's those, the, the pliers, the others are just, you know, uh, side cutters. Don't, don't use your, uh, plastic cutters, uh, on this cause it'll, it'll just ruin them. This is very thin wire, but it's still, I wouldn't use, uh, your plastic wire cutters on them. So this is the tip of those tiny crescent, um, pliers. And I just wanted you to see that they're flat, right? And, and they're pretty precise. So if you have something like that, that works just fine. This for me is the pair that I like to use because what I'm gonna do is I have to grip just the end of one piece of that 32 gauge wire uh, as, I'm, as I'm wrapping around. So we're gonna see how that works. And those are the tools that we're gonna show you. I'm, I'm make sure I got all the tools here. Uh, yes, I did, how about that? So uh, I'm gonna swap now to the, the, uh, the camera here that will show you this. Now, what this is, is a little frame. There's a, a wood along the bottom here uh, that holds two posts. And then I've got just little cup hooks in the end there. And, and I can show a close up of it a little bit later. And then I've got this wire wrapped around here. And, and the wire, like I said, it, it comes loose, but I want to kind of keep it tight. Now, I've got some barbs already on that. But that's not going to, I don't think that's going to hurt from seeing what I'm doing. So what I do is I take these and then um, I've got a little piece of the wire here. And I'm just grabbing about a 32nd or a, I don't know, maybe a 16th of an inch. I, I, I might have to trim it down, but I try not to. And I just come down here and then I place this right up to the wire. Now here's something important. There's a little lip underneath here, you know, the end of the plier. I'm putting that right on the wire. And, and the reason is I want to get the wrap right around the wire as close to the end of the pliers as possible. I take it over there. And then when I come back around, I go to my left. See, I'm going in this direction. I'm trying to get my hand in there so you can see it. I go in that direction, not straight, but I'm going to the left. And the reason is if I don't, I'll make the loop that goes around the, the wire I'm wrapping around. It'll be too big and it, and it won't grip it. It could actually just fall off the little, little barb that I'm making. So I wrap it around two times and then just clip it. And that's it. So like I said, it's just like the simplest thing. It's, it's just, as, as, just as you think it might be, uh, you know, how to do it. There's no mystery to it, but it's um, extremely tedious and it takes a long time. So <laughs> it's like the worst of both worlds. Uh, it takes a long time. It's tedious, uh, but it makes great wire. So now that I have a few on there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to space them out. I can just take a pair of pliers. Um, if they grip a little bit, that's great because we're going to glue them at a distance. And I like to have them maybe a quarter of an inch apart. So I'm just going in here and I'm spacing them out. Um, I know it's a little bit out of focus. Let me see if I can focus that a little better. There we go. So now you can see the wire a little bit. I had to take it off autofocus because it was just going bananas. It can't, it can't pick up this wire. But once I've got these spaced out a little bit, that's where the glue comes in. I want to put just a little dab of this glue on each one of those just to kind of hold them in place. If I don't, it makes the next part just a little difficult. So I'm just taking a tiny dab of glue and right on there. Now this is where the two wraps around the wire help because by having two wraps there, I'm giving a place for the glue to hold to. The glue gets in those coils of the wire and then it holds it there. Okay, so now that I have that, 
I'm going to go back and then, and I would I would do the whole thing before I do this next part, but obviously you don't want to wait for that. So I'm going to take another piece of wire here and I'm just going to wrap and 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 as I'm wrapping the second piece of wire, I, I want to secure it at this end. And then I'm just wrapping it around so that I have dual strands of wire. As I'm wrapping it around, I am locking in those barbs. They've been glued, but they, they're still a little bit loose. And that locks them in. Now, again, this is tedious. It's hard. It's not easy in the slightest. But I got to tell you, it looks like real barbed wire. When I first did this for my first World War I um, diorama, I, I went down the rabbit hole and I did my research. My research. There's only there's over 2,500 patents for barbed wire in the United States. So barbed wire is not. I mean, look, you you have a lot of leeway in your design, but when you look at barbed wire, typically the barb is a single barb or a single piece of wire that goes around one of the long strands of wire two times, sometimes three. Again, there's different patents out there for different ones. One more wrap around, that's a new patent. So it goes around two times and then the secondary wire works its way around it, locking those barbs in place. So when I went down that rabbit hole and I looked at all that, this was the best method I came up with to go ahead and, you know, kind of recreate that. So once you've got these guys on here and you've done the whole length of it, then I, I've done it both ways. Sometimes I'll paint it on here. Sometimes I'll take it off. Like I'll do three or four of them and then paint them all at once. But for painting them, I use... Vallejo wash. See, I got to get it in the in the uh, focus zone. Uh, I like to use Vallejo wash. Uh, this is the light rust. And then I'll use uh, the old rust from the Vallejo pigments. Now, I've done this in 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 different ways. The, the big difference is, is I want a light rust and I want a dark rust. I want a little bit of contrast. So I've done it where I've used the lighter rust because there's like one that's almost yellow. You know, it's like super light of the pigment. And then I do the old wash, okay? And, and I just want to vary it because I do want a little bit of a variation on um, my barbed wire. So that's it. I mean, that's as easy as it is to make barbed wire. It does not take a, a lot um, this little jig, I'm in a wood shop, so okay, it's easier for me. But if you have the ability to make up something, we just need something that's going to hold that that wire taut um, so that I can wrap and, and work with it. Um, I will give dimensions for this. I will give you, you know, some more information on this little jig that I made because I've, I've gosh, I've had it for a few years now because it just works fine. Uh, I haven't had to replace it or, or, or do anything else. Um, one of the difficulties of this is the fact, and, 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 and I'll kind of show you this real quick. I'm going to go back to this wire. This wire stretches. So when I started, this was taut. Okay, so it was stretched tight. But as you work with it, the, this will sag and stuff. So what I do is I just make sure that I leave a little like a pigtail, you know, a little bit left so I can wrap it around it and re-tighten it. Works just fine. Um, you have to be careful when you're starting doing it because as you're doing it, I, like I said before, I have just like you, you graze your hand over it, you're reaching for something, you just pop it. So it takes a little bit getting used to, but you can knock out a heck of a lot of wire. I did the wire on this. I'm going to see if I can refocus. Yeah, I don't know why not. Heck. I do this kind of wacky stuff all the time during my, my live stream. So <laughs> I'm going to try and refocus this on my World War I diorama so that you can see uh, some of the wire work I did there. You know, because I did, I did quite a bit. And how it interplays with the trench, with the sandbags, 
with debris in the wire, I think is really important. I want debris in the wire. I see that in all the pictures, movies, all that kind of stuff that I've seen. And so I think that's that's kind of a, a an important thing. Hey, I got a couple of, I got restaurant quality says, hey, Bill, it's Evan. Hey, Evan, how's it going? Nice to see you. Don't be confused by the word channel name. I'm working on a cooking project. That's wonderful. Thanks very much, Evan. Evan is one of our patrons. And um, uh, I haven't seen him for a little while. So it's really, really, really nice to see you, Evan. Thanks very much for coming on. I appreciate that. So I'm going to swap over and we're going to take a look now at my World War I diorama. So this is the first one that I did. And I'm going to zoom in. Let's see how we can look. See. And this is what I mean by kind of the interplay with your wire. When, when you do your wire, um, it shouldn't be just perfect wire, right? They had one heck of a lot of um, uh, stuff going on. Your wire, as a matter of fact, I don't have enough wire in here because um, you would just see where wire had been uh, like rolled over by a tank or because uh, artillery, it's just blown up. So there's just like huge wire balls laying out there in, in no man's land. Um, so that's the kind of stuff. I use both wood and uh, the steel pickets, like I made the steel pickets. And we'll look at those in a second too. But the point is, I, I think that variation and then having stuff in the wire, having stuff, you know, dirty in that zone is, is really going to help your diorama. Um, at least I, that's just my opinion. I mean, you obviously, you do your own diorama, but uh, that's what I would say. Uh, I have a dumb question from John Hayes. Hey, John, how's how's it going? Thanks very much for coming on. Uh, what's the purpose of some die-cast figures that are expensive and have weight to them? Um, I think that's a general question, which I, I really like having general questions. And what's the purpose? I think they last, number one. Um, I've got a few die-cast figures. I have like small airplanes and stuff like that. Uh, Corgi. I, I really like Corgi because uh, it's pretty good stuff. When you go back and you look at those old toy collectors, you don't see a lot of plastic. You see a lot of die cast. You see a lot of metal cars, tin, tin cars and stuff like that. I've got a relative that actually makes cars, tin cars for toy collectors and stuff like that. They're very hugely expensive, um, but they last. They just last. So I think that's maybe the purpose of it. I don't know. There's, I imagine there's some good market research out there, but uh, thanks for the question, John. That's cool. And John always has great questions. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that. If you have questions, you know, I like to talk about diorama, virtually any part of diorama I can. So uh, just ask questions if you got them. Uh, I think my pickets are sitting over here. So I'm going to go get my pickets and show them to you real quick. So I made these before and I showed you my little picket uh, making jig, that I, I will agree is a heck of a lot easier than making uh, the barbed wire. But I really like these little pickets because they're uniform. And then I can still, you know, simulate blowing them up or, or, or having them damaged when, you know, it comes to that. So these are the pickets that I just made. I don't know if it's going to focus properly, but this is the one that I just made um, off of my jig. And so I'm going to put those in there. I'm going to put wood ones in there. Um, they're going to be blown up. They're going to be messed up. And then you just want your wire going everywhere. Now, each and every one of those, there's four holes or, or four loops in the, the steel picket. Those were meant to hold a strand. So they were having, you know, four strands of wire going across there. Um, when I was in the military, we did a lot of wire. Uh, I was in Berlin. And so uh, before the wall came down, so one of our exercises was to go ahead and put up a lot of wire, concertina and barbed wire. And um, the amount that you put up in a defensive position um, it's immense. I mean, it's just, you, you, you can't figure out or you just can't conceive how much wire you'll actually put up unless you've actually done it. Um, so one of the things that I did when I was supplying myself up is I've got four more. So I've got six of these rolls. Each of these 
is uh, but uh, 27 meters. So I will most likely, oh, that's one of the things online. Um, that's that's going to make it, you know, a long job. It's not something I can do in a weekend. It's probably going to take a number of weeks to get all the barbed wire for it. Um, if I could invent a little machine to do it, and I've looked at that. I've looked at the little machines that do it because they're very simple machines. It's a lot of moving parts, uh, but it's actually quite simple. Um, but to make it in scale, because you've seen some people do chain link online. Uh, I thought about that. I, psh, I don't I don't think I'm going to. So I'm going to be doing this for a lot. Uh, and, and this one works pretty good for me. Hey, Neil's here. Uh, Neil says, hi, Bill. Uh, thanks very much for coming on, Neil. Um, I don't know where you get your barbed wire, Neil. Do you make it yourself? Because um, <clears throat> I've seen your barbed wire and it looks pretty darn good. His is one six scale. Uh, this is one thirty second. Have you ever had a scene with pewter pieces? Ages ago, I came across a store in the United States. Whole store was pewter. Yeah, that that used to be a big big deal. Lots of pewter stuff. Uh, but you know, when I was up in Toronto years and years and years ago, John, I found some really nice, I got a pewter frame, picture frame, that was just really nice. Um, Evan says, I just had an idea. What about dotting glue on wire and then sprinkling tiny static grass on it? You know, that's not bad. Um, I, wh what I run into is this. Some things are so familiar, like barbed wire. You know, I think everybody knows what barbed wire looks like, that if you get a little bit too far away from it, then you can lose that suspended belief. You know, I'm already making it so small that they've got to believe that it's going to look like that when they look at it. You know what I mean? Um, if I get too far away, because you can see the little coils, you can see the little barbs. If I get too far away from that, I might not be able to pull it off basically. Um, because that's the other thing, just the dot you would have, especially with the static grass, you'd have a lot of little spines coming off that look like a little hedgehog, you know? So I'm not sure about that, but this is, this doesn't, I mean, I, I keep saying it's terrible because it is, and it takes a long time because it does, but it's still, I love the result. So I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat conflicted. I want to give you an idea that's, boy, this is going to make your life so much better. And it ain't. But if you go down that road, you're, you're going to get really good barbed wire. I guess that's the uh, that's the, the plus. Um, hey, cheers from Holland. Martin's here. Hello, Martin. And Martin became uh, a patron today. Uh, so now that's the other thing that's cool on my patron site. They now allow folks that, that don't pay uh, to come and see your sites. So you can have followers on your site. So I'm, I'm getting some more uh, folks there too. That's really cool. Thanks very much, Martin. Uh, yes, but easy with large scale. Yeah. So same thing then. Um, you could probably get it manufactured. I don't know if you make your own or, or, or not. Tuned in late was set to clock back an hour wintertime. Ah, that's coming up for us tonight or no, this weekend, Martin. Yeah. Same deal. That's okay. There was totally the train wrecks happened earlier uh, in in the uh, live stream. I had quite a couple of nice train wrecks. So um, if you do go back and watch it, yeah, you can clip a whole bunch of it out. Um, but up, but up, but uh, fair enough. Yeah, I mean it's it's something to look at. You know, uh, I would. I'm trying to think how that would work and, and make it faster because you're still going to want to have to spin that wire and you still want to dual twist. I'm thinking just this might be just easier, you know, but thanks, Evan. I like the idea. You got to think out of the box, folks. Hey, Martin. Good deal. So um, uh, I'm trying to think if I got anything else for you. Um, you know, the other stuff that happened this week was, you know, getting the the the, the editing going. Uh, the editing was a lot of fun. I did a heck of a lot of editing, um, but I, I really hope you like it. Getting back to doing uh, a video a week, uh, I did that for my first year that I was on YouTube, which is a couple of years ago, and it was really brutally difficult. <laughs> like I wasn't, I was not, uh, I was not doing stuff I needed to do, but it was also during COVID, so there were less things that I needed to do, so I could kind of concentrate on this. Forget about it now. Can't. Too much stuff going on. 
Uh, and Evan says, love the studio tour. Thanks very much. I, 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 I hope everybody did. I, you know, I have done these and I'm going to continue doing them because number one, I think it's fun. Uh, but I also have a lot of stuff in here that, that is do an explanation is, is maybe the best way to put it. And the new format of my, uh, video that I showed a little bit earlier, and I just might show that again, cause there's more people on. Um, but this is a new format that I'm kind of going into so that I can get those, those videos out a little bit quicker. And, uh, you know, the, the, the meaning there is I'm kind of shooting my videos now where I'll take my subject and I just literally plunked them right here on the desk. I filmed it and did all my voiceover, all my audio live. And then I took that live recording and then I added all the extra stuff. Like here's how he did this and here's how he did that. And here's some build shots and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm going for. And, and I'm hoping that's going to go uh, uh, a lot better. Production time is much lower in, in, in doing that. And, and that's really what I was looking at. So um, the, the, Cast is about done. The stream is about done, but I would like to go ahead and show you this video one more time. Um, again, it comes out on Tuesday. I'm going to show you about half of it. Uh, and this is the new format that I'm doing. And it is uh, the very first diorama that I ever built. Um, it, well, I tried it. This is the first one I completed um, ever. And uh, it's called Half Track to Tobruk. So I'm just going to play that video again, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. And I'll be right back once it's done. This is my very first diorama where I use the ground effects that I learned from uh, Andy Klein from Andy's Hobby Headquarters. I'll try to zoom in here a little bit better. But uh, I, this is, you know, um, it's, it's a very old, to me, kit, comes with five figures, and that's just brilliant. You know, if you're just getting into it, you got the whole package right there, and then you can come up with your own terrain. So it's just a wonderful kit for that. There's not a heck of a lot of detail on the, um, on the vehicle, uh, and I have no excuse for that paint job. I have no idea what I was thinking. Um, it's not really even a paint job. It was just me dabbing paint on it. These figures didn't come out too bad. I was, you know, I, I kind of dog myself on my figures because I really have a, issues with my own figures. And then I'll see something I did. It's like, well, that's actually not too bad. I do want to kind of tell a little story. I want to make something a little bit conceivable. Now, when they give you these figures, they're molded in such a way that they almost tell their own story. You know, one guy's running out, one guy's on the gun. You know, this guy's got binos, the guy on the left, the lieutenant, I'm thinking, you know, the officer that's with him. He's like calling him up to set up a position. You know, they go through this little tiny wadi and and on the other side, they set up a machine gun, a crew serve weapon. And, and I think that's neat because the kit itself kind of gets you into that mode, right? It gets you thinking that you can make a little story out of the kit and, and the figures. I mean, I think that's just brilliant because it helped me. It totally told me that I could do that. So what is this? This is uh, foam, just the regular pink foam that I always use. Uh, I carved it with my Fordham. Love it. My Fordham is the best. I used real rock. I used real pebbles and stuff like that. I used the scenic glue from Woodland Scenic, glued everything down. Then I did dusts and, and, and then I overshot it. And I, I did actually quite a bit of work because I didn't know what it was doing. I was trying to get, you know, a look. And, and one of the things, and I'm gonna zoom in again. One of the things that I really liked about doing this was there can be sandy areas in the wadi and stuff like that. But there can also be rock or just hardened sandstone under the loose sand. And that's kind of what I'm doing with those cliffs because those little cliffs there are a little bit darker. And that just told me, man, I can really actually get a believable surface. And that's the thing that had uh, discouraged me all in the past when I tried to do plaster. Plaster always seemed to be something that I never got a handle on. Now I did do plaster. And as a matter of fact, I'm gonna show you that one next. Okay, so that was half of the video, and then it goes into Battle of Narvik. Um, and because it is like, you know, uh, releasing on Tuesday, I don't want to show the whole thing. Um, it's about a eight and a half, uh, nine minute video, 
And um, I really hope you like it. Um, I think as I went along, there's actually a little bit more interaction because, you know, when I, when I, when I first did these dioramas, I never did a video for, uh, you know, half track to two brook. I just built it and moved on. Well, the other ones I have done full video. So the next one, Battle of Narvik, there are six videos that were done for that. The entire build and stuff like that. So I'm pulling from those, but I'm also showing you where you can maybe go and, and see those videos. So there's a little bit of self-promotion there too. Uh, John has another question. Uh, and says, rain effect, drizzle effect, and forced perspective achieved by using diffused window pane a certain degree of amount of distortion. Yeah, I think so. I've seen that. And now are you talking about in like the background with your lighting? Because I've seen that too, where you're throwing shadows off that diffused window pane with drizzling water and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not sure which you're, you're referencing, John. Um, Force per sector achieved by using a diffused window pane to create a certain amount of... Story. Yeah, I'm not sure. But I've seen it been done in photography, but I haven't seen it done like in a diorama. But I like that idea a lot. Thanks very much, John. So thank you very much, everyone. I, I hope everybody had a, a good week, uh, at least a passable week, because it is Friday. So we've got a weekend coming up. Um, here is Martin. Maybe a question if it fits in. Could you tell something about how you do the skin tones on your figures? It's too much off topic. No problem. Or maybe next time. No, that's perfectly fine. Um, so very good point. I, I have all of my paints over here. And like I said uh, before, I like to use uh, Vallejo. I paint blocking in on my figures. I paint all the base colors to include the flesh with uh, Tamiya. And so I'll use Tamiya flat uh, flesh, you know, the flesh tone XF15 flat flesh. And so that's the first flesh that I put on my figures. The flesh, basically every base color I put on. And then the next step I will do is, is go in and start on the face. So when I do the face, the ones that I went with are dark flesh, medium, and where is it? Here we go. So the, the light rust is a big jump, I know, but I use light rust for my heaviest shadows. So that is the first one I use. And this is, uh, it's Vallejo, but it's a Panzer Aces, but it's light rust. Um, so deep in the eye sockets, or if I'm trying to do like uh, the cheek, like a hollow out cheek or something like that, underneath here, uh, underneath the um, eyebrow, uh, ears, all that kind of stuff, that first gets this. And, <clears throat> excuse me. The method that I use, and, and, and you know, I've said before, I don't really talk in terms of I'll show you how to paint because I'm I feel like I'm still learning. But there are a few basic things that I do that I think are OK for everybody. Um, and so what I do is I'll start with that and then I'll paint back with flat flesh. But I'm using the acrylic flat flesh. Where is it? Uh, basic, basic skin tone. So it doesn't look like it. This looks a lot pinker than the Tamiya, but when you put it on, it matches really well. So it's nice. So I'll put in my dark rust in the deep recesses of the face, the lips, the nose, the eyes, all of that. And I'm not all that careful. I want to get it in there. And then I'll come back with basic skin tone and then I'll, I'll, I'll paint back toward it. Now, what I figured out that does is when I'm painting back toward the dark, everything I paint over still leaves a little bit of a shadow. I got some water. I'm going to dry out again. So it still leaves a little bit of a shadow. It's not exactly pink, you know, the flat flesh, but it's also not this dark, dark. 
And so it does its own little pre-shading. So then I move to this. Now, this brown rose, this is like for like high cheekbones or somebody that's been running, you know, on the, uh, the forehead, make the forehead really red. Um, or if somebody's doing something aggressive or something like that, I use this. I use this on even on the high cheekbones. But then I still come back over it with the basic skin tone. Um, by doing that, and, and I didn't come up with this. Uh, this is a modification of CW Modeling's um, uh, Figures My Way. Uh, figures My Way or Painting My Way. He's got a nice series of how he paints his figures. And through watching his over the years, this is kind of what I've picked up from it. And he does the same thing. He'll start with his base tones. But, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't do the start blocking in like I do. He'll paint his by brush everything. But then I'll use the darks and they'll paint back with the skin tones and it, it, it brings out shadows like under the eyes. You know, if there's like bags under the eyes or there's like some some darkness around the eyes by having the dark in there and then painting back to it, it, it works really well. Um, then I will go to a medium flesh and finally a dark flesh. Now. When I say go to those, it's almost the exact same process. I will I will bring in the dark, like on the upper here, underneath the chin, all that kind of stuff. But then I'll kind of feather it back in. I always go back to that, that basic skin tone. It becomes highlights later on, you know. And I don't have to go any lighter than this unless it's like a, I'm trying to do like a really sunny day. That's how I do it. And, and, and that... That layering seems to give me some underlying colors. Now, you're not seeing it on these. You're seeing it on one of the guys I did because the mud just totally blew it out. But I felt really comfortable on doing it on this guy and how he came out. And, and, and I'll see if I can go to this other camera real, real quick. Um, and, yeah, that's just terrible. But... On him, I think it came out that way pretty good, you know, and it, that's the that's the method that I use. So the dark, and I just kept moving out away from the dark with the lighter stuff. And I think it came out okay. Um, it's not perfect. There needs to be more on his jawline. you know, and a little bit more on the side of the face, but I'm, I'm happy with that. So that's kind of my, uh, how I do it, uh, Martin. Um, I'm, I see yours that you, you posted earlier today online, uh, the MAK, the 120, if you're doing. Boy, it looks better than mine already. So I don't know if I got anything to tell you <laughs> because that looked really nice. But yeah, that's kind of how I do it. Uh, and John says, looking through the paint. So that makes sense. Yeah, so looking through the paint and gives it that really nice. That would be kind of cool. I could hold it up in front of the camera. And, and do it. I've seen some folks do some really neat stuff like that. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Seeing figures taking cover from rain. Oh, I like that idea. I do like that idea. You know, running, you know, into some cover from rain. Uh, that's a great idea. That's really cool. Thanks, John. Um, and then light rust is a great move for shadows. I have used it. I am all about glazes, thin, thin, thin. Yeah, Evan, that's really good because... When you're trying to get that stuff in, you know, it's too easy to overcorrect. And I've done that, the overcorrection thing, where I'm thinking, oh, I need more like this. And then I, I just lose what I've done. Um, the acrylics, it's not so bad. I, these I'm not doing wet. So that's the other thing. I like to do uh, wet blending when I'm doing a big surface. Like if I'm doing a door, classically, I did this one door with, and, and I did this wet blending on it where I had my stuff and I kept adding water and I, and I kept adding different pigments and, and I and get a little bit of swirl and, and I got just some wonderful stuff. And so wet blending there was great. On my figures, no, I've not, I've not been able to do it. It's, it's really kind of going back and forth. They dry in between because I'm using such small amounts of paint that they do dry in between those, but they also show through because I am doing really thin. So I, I might be, I might be closer to what you're doing, Evan. Thanks very much. 
Uh, remember dark vermilion, super thin. Yeah, dark vermilion. I've got, you know, I used vermilion in oils when I was trying oils and cause that's, I didn't have any red, but it was like this crimson ish, you know, the vermilion was great. Good stuff. Uh, I use bay coat of flesh color, slightly redder than use really fine down paint and do very light washes each one so that they, so that with different colors, you can achieve real flesh color. That's fantastic. Now that's something that I I'm hoping Neil can talk about because I've seen Neil's figures and they look like a photograph and I'm not joking and I'm not trying to, you know, blow smoke or nothing like that. They look like a photograph. Um, they're really well done. So yeah, I'd like to get there. It's, um, and, and, and Neil and I have been talking about, you know, doing something on the channel, uh, to, to, you know, to have him in one of the live streams and, um, or record, I'm not sure exactly how we'll do it yet, but I'm really excited about that because his faces, his figures, his clothing that he does just remarkable, just remarkable. And the composition, see, that's the other thing, Neil. I think that's one of the deals that really pulled me is your composition. When you're taking your, your pictures of how you're laying out, you know, everything in your diorama, brilliant. It is that view that you're trying to capture and you do that very, very well. So I'm really, really excited to have you on. So everybody else can see that. And we, we talk about it. You can add freckles under some of the coats. That's awesome. So it's like, like duller and stuff. I wonder about age spots. That's what I got to start thinking about. That's really cool, Neil. Do you start with eyes before skin? No, I actually do eyes after uh, because eyes are a dot. I used to do the eyes, you know, with I, I, I do white and then my brown and then black, you know, the vertical and then do. The, yeah, I. And it's just I can't I can't get it. I've done it and it works out pretty good, but I lose patience. Honestly, it's not. It's, it's nothing more than that. I lose patience and I'll go, oh, and, and like I'll mess it up or something. But yeah, I, I just do dots now and it's perfectly fine. It, I don't even have to do eyes. Um, on a really nice figure, you might. But like this guy, the one I was just holding up, his eyes are basically closed. He's like looking straight down. I, I, don't, I don't get it. So yeah, it's something to deal with. I like the, the sculpting on the ICM kits. Don't get me wrong. It's just that the eyes are literally, you can see the eyelids looking down. So yeah, there's not there anything left to, to paint. Nice. I also have a cavalry red and bring it to the life. If you will, do you have that one too? I don't know if I have cavalry red, but uh, I, I'd like to get it. I also want to get some new paints that, because some of mine are getting a little old and, and they're getting harder and harder to, to reconstitute. You know, they settle. So I need to look at, at maybe some better paints. For rain, separate fiberglass cloth into individual strands. Hold strands so that they are straight. Apply clear epoxy resin, non-yelling strands with small brush light dry. Oh, very, very cool. I love the idea for rain because I've seen that done a few times, John. That's fantastic. I want to try that. Now, is it just... Because I know you can get different kinds of fiberglass. Is it just straight fiberglass or like fiberglass sheet that you s separate? I'd like to hear more about that, John. Sorry, my throat gets gets dry. <clears throat> I'm now starting with my, uh, to me, a red hull as base for skin. See how that works out. Wow. Red hull. Well, you know, it does... Because that was one of the things when I did um, uh, Tarawa, I, because I did similar to that, Martin, I did the flesh first. And then I remember that crimson I talked about. Then I put crimson over the whole face. It looked like he was like running through pitchforks or something. So the whole face looked almost bloody. It was horrible looking. But then that whole painting back with the top coat thin over the top. I thought they came out pretty darn good. Um, and, and I liked them. So the red, yeah, the red really works. That's where um, this one, no, that's the light rust. Uh, this one, the brown rose, it, you know, it almost looks like a, I don't know, kind of a, a pastel pink almost. But man, for for under cheeks and, and, and stuff like that to give kind of a, you know, a red, face look. I like that crimson rose and it's not 
it's not bright, bright red. So you can you can do it after you've done a few um, a few layers. Now I, I talk like I'm just like this great painter. I'm not. You've seen my figures. They're not, but I'm working, and <laughs> you know I'm I'm working at it. So any of your suggestions, I will try them. Uh, Martin, I love Calvary Red. Great color. Yeah, really, really good. Uh, I got googly eyes whenever I try to paint them. I'm right there with you, Eric, and I've got the photographic proof to to prove it. Um, yeah, I, it's like they look like they're really, really surprised, you know, uh, clown eyes. Uh, I seen crazy wood carver that makes miniature uh, stuff size of a head of a matches. Yeah, I have that. I have seen that. Um, as a matter of fact, this week I saw one where somebody was, uh, I don't know what he was carving. But it was on. A, it was rice, and I'm just like, dude, that's crazy stuff. I am not sure exactly. I was just researching rain effects. That's really cool, John. I like that because I saw, I saw a diorama where the rain was coming hard. You know, coming down really hard, and they had like the the splashes coming up from the puddles. It was just brilliant. And and I also think it was done, there were like horses and carts. So I think it was like uh, maybe Civil War era, you know, 1700s, something like that, 18th century stuff. It was really well done. Uh, and it was a busy scene. It wasn't like one horse and one guy. There was like a bunch of people and all this rain. It was really well done. Uh, I would like to do that rain. I just think it's such an a neat looking, you know, effect. Uh, haven't got there yet. Yeah. Cross eyes as well. Yeah. That's the other thing. You know, I, I'm, I'm always thinking about, and even, I even talk about it in the video that's coming out on Tuesday where, you know, eye connections and, 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 you know, people, you know, it's important, I think in a diorama that if you have a couple of people or multiple people, whatever the case may be, somebody has to make some contact you know, the eyes have to be looking together. And it's those connections, those that 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 contact that you can show within a diorama that really makes um, makes it look alive, like they're having a conversation or there's some kind of connection between them. Well, if they got googly eyes, then it looks like he's making fun of them. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I, um, I just want to take my time. And I didn't get a chance to take my time. I was kind of rushed this week because I was doing the editing thing. But uh, this next week, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to just really buckling down and, um, you know, getting in there and, and, and you know, just, just spending time in painting. Um, this week, just didn't, it just wasn't happening. Uh, hey, Scott Roberts is here. Hey, Scott, thanks very much for coming in. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Um, we're kind of just talking at this point because I, I, I done showed everything I got to show. Uh, so if you've got any questions, I'd love to answer them, but we're just kind of BSing back and forth, uh, which is fun too. So if you have any questions, do ask, uh, Hey, Hey Scott, thanks very much for coming in and yeah. Uh, ask a question. If you've got something, it sounds like you're, you're working something up, um, next week. So I, I've got that video coming out next week. And then the week following the video that's coming out on Tuesday. The next video is going to be on Tarawa. And I haven't visited that in a long, long time. And I think it'll be really fun to do a video on Tarawa. You know, when I did Tarawa, that was my first diorama that kind of really got out there and exploded a little bit. And it was like my first one to a thousand and then my first one to 10,000 and my first one to 15,000, all that kind of stuff. I think it's a 15, maybe not, but it was my first video you know, or diorama that really got some notice. Well, I'm going to shoot then another video on that next week. Uh, I'm going to have it on the bench, kind of like that format. Um, there's a lot more to that one. So I'll have more. So it's just one in the, in the episode, but I think it's going to be um, a, a fun one. And um, like I said, that'll come out uh, the following week after this Tuesday. Um uh, Martin says, well, thanks a lot. Once again, Bill, I'll check for train tricks later. Cheers from Holland. They're there. You'll see them. Thanks a lot, Martin. We'll see ya. Well, thanks for everybody. I, I really had a great time today. You know, uh, there's always a train wreck in, in one of my, uh, one of my live streams. So, uh, if you like that, this is your place. Um, thank you so much, everybody. 
Um, there's a couple of events going on locally this, uh, this weekend. AMP Seattle, Eric is president of AMP Seattle. AMP Seattle is going to be at the FH Cam, which is the, boy, if I can uh, remember it, it's a museum up in Everett, uh, Washington. Uh, but it is the, what is FH Cam? It is the Fighting Heritage and Combat Armor Museum. And the neat thing about this is, is it's a smaller museum, but it's chock full of the greatest stuff. So if you go in there, you're like, oh, there's a small. And then you go over and there's more. And you go over and there's more. So it's not a small museum. There's a lot to it. And um, everything in it runs. Um, it, it was built up a few years ago um, by uh, one of the Microsoft uh, early uh, found, founders of it. Um, and he, he wanted to make sure that everything in it was still flyable. So everything in there runs, everything in there can fly. Um, and it's a really, really neat uh, uh, museum. And it's a really neat deal. Amp Seattle is going to be there and they build. I'm not going to be there this weekend. I, I had prior engagements, but uh, they build, they get to interact with you. They talk. Eric's going to be there uh, and a lot of other great modelers. Uh, thanks very much, Eric. See, I, you know, I'm at that age where it's like, I think of something and I'm like, uh, okay, what can I say before I remember what I really wanted to say? Cause I just, pff, I forget everything. Um, Paul Allen. There you go. I, I remember it was a Paul, but I couldn't remember Allen. Um, and so it's really fun. Uh, and great. So thanks everybody. Have a great weekend. Eric, have a wonderful time up there. I wish I was coming up. I can't make it this weekend, but I know you guys are going to have a, a wonderful time. Uh, everybody else, I hope you get a little chance to get at the bench. If you get to do a little bit of painting, uh, send me some pictures. You guys can send me pictures and emails and texts and stuff like that. I would love to see them. And if you show me, if you send me something, we'll put it up on the live stream. So that would be fun. Everybody have a great one. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, John. Uh, and thanks again, Eric. Uh, I really, really appreciate that. Really appreciate it. Have a good one, Evan. We'll see ya. Bye-bye.